right. Uh, today is going to be my first time. My, I'm going to be on YouTube later, you know. So I have some requests. <laughs> so I'm going to start doing that and watch next week. It's at zero views. And uh oh, what happened to my request? But anyway, uh, we'll see. Yeah, um, it's going to be a very short sermon today, talking a lot about Christ at the end. Um, as you know, I've been speaking from Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiastes chapter three sixteen through four three. And in there, um, you get to see little interesting things about, about human beings. And, you know, last week we talked about how there's time to do this, time to do that, and all kinds of different things. And we understand that time is very, things that pass you, you by. You can't really control time. Even though time is a uh, property, uh, then I read something this week. It says that, you know, everybody can time travel. We're traveling time forward, you know? We are, right? You can't really take the time stop, make the time stop, but it's actually going forward. We're kind of going along with the time. And uh, they say, your leg experiences time a little bit faster, a little bit slower than your head because uh, Earth gravitational force, uh, when it gets stronger, time actually slows down, you know? Did you guys know that? Dilation of time, right? You see, in physics 211, come on guys, you know, make, uh, you're probably very proud in understanding on those kind of things. And um, one thing I want to share with you is that from Ecclesiastes, you, you kind of see the notion of how human being may be the same as um, animals or beasts, they say. You know? And so I found this little short uh, YouTube video that I want you to see. And the point of it is that it is all the evolutionist. The point is that they just they don't know either, you know. And and what they're saying is that we don't know, but the answer is out there. And so take a look at this video, all right? Have we discovered our most important human ancestor? Did Neanderthals first appear hundreds of thousands of years earlier than we thought? Could the human family actually be less diverse than we imagined? In the past few days, scientists have raised these questions and provided some unexpected possible answers. While we don't have anything close to a complete picture of humanity's origins, this recent research has given us some tantalizing clues about where we came from. I'm Hank Green, and this is SciShow News. I do a special, a special Humans are strange animals, and two new studies are reminding us just how out of touch we are with why humans are so uniquely awesome. The first, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences this Monday, outlined the giant international mind-boggle that took place when a group of anthropologists tried to apply new methods to a classic question. Who is our common ancestor with Neanderthals? Hoping to pioneer a more testable quantitative method of answering this question in a field that is fairly qualitative, a group of Australian, Spanish, and American researchers turned to our teeth. Specifically, they graphed 1,200 different points on the molars taken from 13 different species of human ancestors. Then they used some fancy statistical analysis to identify which tooth shapes could have evolved into both our teeth and the teeth of Neanderthals. Whoever had the molars that fit that description, the reasoning went, could be the ancestor of both human species. But they concluded, with high statistical confidence, that none of them could have. Which suggests that we still haven't discovered the common ancestor that we share with our thick-browed cousins. But on top of this, the science has also found that many of the different species that lived in Europe over time, like Homo heidelbergensis and Homo antecessor, had molars that looked a lot like Neanderthal teeth, even though some of those were nearly a million years old. The weird thing is, we thought that Neanderthals weren't even a thing until about 350,000 years ago. So this is all very interesting and a little confusing, and I'm sure a little corner of the internet will no doubt start drawing all kinds of nutty conclusions about what this might mean for human evolution. But the scientists say that the new study, quote, tells us that there are still new hominin finds waiting to be made. In other words, the answers are out there, just waiting to be discovered. The human puzzle got even more interesting with the cover story from the October 18th issue of Science, which detailed a controversial study of Homo erectus, one of our most recent ancestors. Excavating a site in the Republic of Georgia, a team of anthropologists uncovered five skulls of the Homo genus. And they were really, really weird. All five skulls had drastically different traits, even though they were all found in the same spot, and about the same age, about 1.8 million years old. Some of the variations could be explained by differences in age and sex, but the most unusual specimen, an adult male, had the protruding upper jaw and tiny brain case of much earlier human ancestors like Australopithecus, 
but it had the general skull and body shape of Homo erectus. As a group, the specimens seemed to have mostly Homo erectus-like traits, and a 3D analysis confirmed that the variation between them was within reason for members of a single species, just a highly variable species. So the team ended up classifying the specimens as belonging to a single early form of Homo erectus, which they called Homo erectus or Gastrogeorgicus. However, they say the skulls were different enough that if they hadn't come from the same spot, they would likely have been classified as different species. So putting them all in the same category has set off a debate about how we think about our hominid ancestors and about ourselves. If these diverse specimens are all members of the same species, how does the confusing patchwork of even older hominid remains in Africa compare? And what about us? What if the family Homo is less diverse than we thought? In that case, what does it mean to be human at all a million years ago or today? Just like with the study of our Neanderthal brethren, the skulls found in Georgia don't give us any easy answers. But they do broaden our knowledge enough to make us revise what we think we know, which is how science is supposed to work. Thanks for watching this episode of SciShow News, and a special warm and fuzzy thanks to SciShow Subbable subscribers. Would you like an honorary SciShow title, like associate producer, or maybe president? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, I, I like this kind of things because, you know, like, they don't know. You know, then as how science works, you know, they can make some conclusions, but any new data can come along and their conclusion could be changed. You know, so science is all about observing and experimenting, and, uh, but history, you can't really do experiments on history, right? History, you have to do it by evidentiary method. You get a lot of evidences, and I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. So open your Bibles to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 16, and then you can, when you read the text, you get to understand why I showed you that little little video. So let's take some time to read these verses. Ready? Go. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regards to the children of men, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of men, and what happens to the beasts, is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. The man has no advantage over the beast, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth? So I saw that there was nothing better than man should rejoice in his work, for that is his, his love. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? And a little bit of chapter 4. <coughs> Again I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet born, and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. The reason I want to, I end it right there is because there's that common theme of this oppression, this evilness, the wickedness that we can plainly see in our world. You just need to open your eyes and see it. You know, there's a, you know, have you heard about the Nevada, the middle school? This person, a middle schooler, went to school, took a gun, tried to hurt, I guess, you know, maybe he was bullied, and I don't know exactly what's going on, but teacher was killed, and he killed himself. And there was another case of, um, I guess, this golfer. You know how there's a lot of houses around the golfing courses, right? And I guess there's this golf ball, maybe came and hit their house, so he just went out there and shot the dude. And I don't know if he died or not, but, you know, I'm, that made me think twice about playing golf. You know, uh, because I'm not a really good golfer, but you never know. But, and there's another case, I don't know what city it was, but there's this boy, he got, somehow he didn't go to school, and so his friend uh, left a um, pellet gun. So he was going to take the pellet gun to his friend's house, 
So while he was walking, a policeman saw him and that looked just very real, right? Those pelican looks very real. And I guess told him to stop uh, or, or I don't know, stop, turn around or something. Then as he was turning around, and I guess the policeman got scared, so he shot him and he died. You know, and so it's a crazy world we're living in. That's why we choose to live in San Luis Obispo because there's a less population here or whatever reason it is, but you can see there's a oppression, there's evil, and there's wickedness, there's fear, all kinds of things happening in this world. And when you look around, and it's so evident that we see all that. And that's what he was seeing. And King Solomon is a pretty smart guy. And you see how he says, I saw and I said in my heart, and he kind of draws that conclusion a little bit later. So he's very um, methodical in talking about and thinking about these things. He's, he reflects it and he draws some. Um, and so what is he talking about? This place of justice, this place of righteousness. You know, place of justice, it sounds like a court system. Have you ever been to a court and you were unfairly treated? Yeah, I, I have. I, you know, I used, when I was young and kind of dumb, right now I'm just dumb. You know, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> and you, you know, I got a lot of traffic tickets because I have to go fast in my car. Yeah. You know, right? <laughs> uh, so, so I went fast several times and I got caught and, you know, and one time I went to a court and because my ticket said I was going over 55 miles an hour um, in a 25 miles an hour zone. And I said, it's impossible. My, I, I had a nice car, but it wasn't that nice. And, and also, I came out of the parking lot, and I sped, and I had to stop. You know, so I went to the court, and I got all my physics charts, you know, right? Like, you know, right? D equals RT and acceleration and all that. It's impossible for me to go that fast. Maybe at best, I was going 40. You know, and so I was... And, and, and four of the policemen came. So that was pretty a pretty amazing scene, you know. Three police car came after me and they kind of stopped me and I thought, wow, this is like the movies. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and so I went to the court and all four policemen showed up. And they said, and then I explained to them, hey, I came out of this parking lot right here and I sped, you know, and also, you know, I had those, those mufflers, it sounds really loud, but you're not going really fast, you know, right? And one of those, and then I stopped, you know, so it's impossible for me to go that fast. Maybe fast, I was going 40, you know. And he says, no, you did not come out from the parking lot. You came straight. And I said, what? I came from the parking lot. You know, and it was four against one, so I couldn't do anything else. Right? Then, okay, well, where's my checkbook, you know? <laughs> I had to write a check, you know? Uh, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things like that. And even was wickedness and also in the place of righteousness. What are those places of righteousness? You know, maybe church, where people ought to behave utmost that reflects the glory of God in justice, in righteousness, in love, in care, in kindness. And even, even in maybe place of government, right? We have three branches of government. In all those places, maybe they ought to behave who are like educated, you know, they got, you know, bachelor's degrees and master's degree and they're ex-lawyers and they're highly educated. And but what happened to this justice? What happened to this righteousness? What happens that you see in their lives is lots of wickedness, evil, and oppression. And there's this power. Or maybe this lawyer, right? There's so many <laughs> lawyer jokes, right? Right? You know, right? And also, maybe some schools, the teachers ought to care for you, but they don't really care for you. You know, and those things, you see that wickedness, not kindness, all over our world. And this is what Solomon saw too. Maybe he was under disguise and trying to see the court system, government system, schools, or synagogues, or temples, or churches, or even family. Family ought to be a place where you are caring one another, to loving one another, but because of this power, right, as maybe fathers have, and we oppress our kids, you know, and I'm in guilt of that. You know, a lot of times that you read these kind of things, and we feel that we're the little ones that was oppressing us, but a lot of times that we have the upper hand, that we are oppressing as well. 
We are in those places that we do have power, we do have influences, but a lot of times that you may be receiving that oppression or evilness and wickedness, but a lot of times that we do, we are the ones acting upon other people in our power, in our ability, in our influence, in our uh, the settings that we have, and we're not free of guilt as well. You know, my father died when I was eight years old, you know, and I remember, you know, my father would a lot of times uh, give quizzes to my kids, my, my sisters, my siblings, and my three sisters and my older brother. And, you know, every night he would come home from work and he would ask them, okay, memorize your multiplication table. And if they don't memorize it right, then you get the big, like, you know, they call it love, you know, stick or something, you know, <laughs> then, right? even though it's a love stick, well, you know what it means, right? You get, you, get, you get hit with that, right? And so hopefully that will motivate them to, you know, better and stuff. And so me seeing all that, like, all oh, better memorize my things right, right? right? So then we kind of act um, according to that, so we're trying to be smart and uh, And so we see all that, and even me, I yell at my kids uh, in the name of love, right? Yeah, so we, I am in need of repentance. I am in need of transformation in our life, in my life, so that I can be a better father. So don't just think as you are receiving this kind of oppression, evilness, and wickedness, then think as we are, we're acting upon this wickedness, this evilness, in our um, um, oppressing others with our power and influence. Yeah, because when you think about sin in the Bible, there's not just sin of always the omission, but sin of commissions as well. But sin of commission is things that God told you not to do, but you do them. Right? Sin of omission is that the, the things that God told us to do, but you don't do. Did you know that there's 51 things in the Bible, in the New Testament, tells you to do with one another, love one another, care for one another, share your burdens with one another, right? There's 51 of them. Are we all practicing that? And if we're not, we are committing sin of omission. Just because you are silent, just because you're there, just because you're not causing harm on one another, no. You may think that, oh man, this is a feel of, or a situation of oppression. Because there's nobody is willing to help. It says, see how he says, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and wicked. And the time will come that maybe those things are allowed right, right now, but surely Jesus, is, Jesus will return and he will judge everything. Not just the bad, right? We kind of see this as a, as a bad, but even good. He, or, he will go award what reward was good, vindicate what has been done good, but also punish what is done evil as well, right? Righteous and wicked. For there is time for every matter and for every word. I said in my heart, the alternative view or, 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 or um, observing, reflecting this is that with, um, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but a beast. For us to see, God is giving us opportunity for us to see without this connection with God. In this realm of brokenness, we are just like the animals. We act just like them. There is no sense of God. There is no sense of what is right or what is wrong. It's all basically doing with our instincts. And so basically the Bible is telling us that God will judge everything. Everyone and every deed. And not everything's bad, but vindicating what is good, what is good, and what is righteous, and also punishing what is bad, what is evil. Yeah. And, and God is allowing us to see the brokenness of this world. That humans are just like animals, right? Which shows us there's something majorly wrong. And that's why I showed you a little video. You know, are we exactly the same? the animals and us? Right? No, we're not the same. When you look at them, we are very different. We develop as people. But animals, they don't develop. Right? Do you see, like, dogs, before they eat, they kind of pray? Maybe not just pray to God, they pray to any, even just giving thanks. In Japan, we say, itadakimasu, right? We say, thank. And in Korea, we say, we say, you're thanking for all the, right? Right? 
bon appétit, right? We say all different things, and why do we say that? What we, what, we're, we're, we're thankful because we can eat. There's a food for us to eat. Right? And so God is allowing us to see this brokenness of the world and this evilness, this wickedness, and this oppression for us to recognize how broken we are. And, and again, it's not just looking out and saying, man, we're so broken. But put a mirror in there, man, I am broken. Do you realize that? Do you realize that you're broken? That you need Jesus? You need help? Right? You are evil? You are wicked? Right? And again, not because you just cause these things like that, but your absence of doing what is right. The things that God very told you to do, very things that God told you to do, when you withhold that kind of action, you are committing the sin of omission. Because God told us to look out for orphans, right? And widows. You know how many orphans are there in, 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 in Africa because of AIDS? So many of them. And shouldn't we be concerned about that? Why? We have so much problem in America. Isn't it what we say that? Yeah, yes, right. We do have a lot of problems in America. But they have problems over there too. You know? Right? This is a global problem. There's a lot of things that we ought to think and pray and do when we don't do those things that God has assigned us to do. We are same thing. We are being wicked. When we think we are number one, we are only looking out for our interest. What does the Bible says in Philippians? Do not look only for your interest, but the interest of others. Do you know what's going on in others' lives around you? Look around. Do you know your roommates' lives? Do you know what's going on in their lives? You know? Yeah. You know, when we act righteous, when we act just, we are better than that. But when we don't act righteous, when we act evil, and when we act unjust, we are just like animals. And verse 20, it tells us, right, uh, all go to one place. And so in conclusion of these things, like what Solomon is observing is that we all die. This concept of death came again and again and again and again, right? And with this brokenness, with, with this disconnection, with God and understanding of that, we have same destiny. Animals die and we die. And because of his limited understanding, he doesn't know what happens after we die. I, like I told you, my father died when I was eight years old. So when I came to college, those, that question, what happens to a person after we die, came to me with a very interest. Right? I came in very interested about that. And so, and I, of course, look into different religions, right? What does Christianity say? What does Buddhism say? What does Islam say? What does this religion say or that religion say, right? Because that is a problem for every person. And how do you overcome this issue? How do you explain this issue of death? And, and, and even in him, he says, who knows whether the spirit of man goes to upward and the spirit of beast goes down into the... And he's saying, he doesn't know. I don't know what happens after we die. Right? And even, even this is showing this kind of oppression, right? And they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressor, there was power. Because there's power, right? They're oppressing them. But even there was no one to comfort them. See, this power not just oppresses them, but this power also limits people in helping one another. Yes, in one sense, we are selfish. We don't want to help one another. But in another sense, that because of this powerful hand is against us, so that it's very hard for us to help. How many of you guys like really want to help somebody, but you may think, well, what if they, get, they sue me? You know, like... Like, you know, Minzu, right? I, uh, what's his? Micah. Micah. Micah's dad. He was in a uh, bicycle trip with Boy Scouts. Right? Yeah. Right? right? Remember that? <laughs> right. And uh, he was riding his bike and he saw a kid, uh, like, you know, maybe off, off the trail, maybe 20 or 30 feet down. 
and he fell off the trail and he fell and he broke the fracture two ribs, right? Right? And and so I guess he saw him and uh, next day he came with uh, maybe not next day but three four days later he got poison oak e kind of everywhere in his legs and stuff like that. Uh, and he had to kind of drag him out of that ditch or hill and stuff like that. And like I said, Eugene, you have a lot of faith, man. What if that boy sues you? <laughs> you know, like what if he had like a broken neck or something like that? And you know, but a lot of times that I that those thoughts come to my mind. Like, what if I try to help them, but what if they sue me? Right? Then what if I have to go to jail? For 20 years, and oh, you, you shouldn't have moved that person. Don't you know any better? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know, you know? I thought he was in this middle of a ditch. I wanted to save him, but right, I didn't know I'm actually hurting him more. But right? weren't you afraid of that? Or do you even care? Or do you even look around? Right? Okay. Only thing that interests you is only yourself. The Holy Trinity. Me, myself, and I. And no one else. And we're just like that. And, and because of this power, it limits us. It's hard to help people. You know, we're trying to do homeless ministry. Do you remember that? Three years ago, right? And the city were saying like, hey, do you have a license for that? Like, what license? We're trying to do something good here. Right? And we're having a lockout for 30 days. You know? But, right? And, right? And so sometimes, because of city, right, I'm sure they may be looking for us or looking out for us trying to protect us, and but the, in the name of that protection, it limits in the good things that even we're trying to do. We're trying to comfort them, but it limits in the ways that we want to do. And it's, again, same thing. I thought the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet born. And this concept of born because this or, or born and death because being dead is better because they don't have to live under this evilness, wickedness, and oppression. But people are better who has not been born yet because they haven't experienced this yet. Those who are dead, they experience this and they're kind of gone out. They don't have to experience it anymore. But the really, the real fortunate ones are the ones that who has not been born yet. But this all comes down to this point where it says, who can bring him to see what will be after him? You know? So th this is a big question about who can uh, help us to understand that what will happen to us when we die, after we die. And because nobody knows. It's a big guess that he's making. Yeah. And, and people do have near-death experiences, and people speculate. Right? And after that, it's, it's hard for us to prove what happens because, you know, Nobody comes back at being after real, real dead, right? Not a couple of hours dead, but person who's really dead, right? And kind of coming back to us that this is what it's like, what it's like. So you better be prepared for that. And that's a big question of who can bring him to see what will be after him. You know, but, but you know the answer, right? Who died for three days, who came back, who resurrected, and people will say, well, he spent three days, he's going to be stinking by now. But who came back from the dead? And the who was there before the beginning of this foundation of the world? It's Jesus who comes back to us after that, telling us all these things. Who is Jesus? Right? And again, it cannot be a watertight, uh, 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 right? It's not watertight arguments and proving things like one plus one. But it's more of an evidentiary method, right? Evidentiary method of giving us enough hints so that it is beyond reasonable doubt. Let me ask you a question. Do you know the seawater is salty? Raise your hand if you think seawater is salty. Beyond reasonable doubt. You know for sure. I can bet my life on it. If I had $10,000, you know, we don't bet, you know, but yeah, yeah, $10,000, if I'm allowed to bet, I will bet on that. Right? Yeah, we do, right? Why? We so we know. How do you know? So my question is to you is like, how do you know that? Have you tasted all the salt water, sea water in the world? No? Maybe twice? And maybe, maybe right? Maybe in science classes they tell you there's a lot of salt in the sea water. But have you? Have you tasted right now? Right? Maybe something happened last night. 
Solar is flaring everywhere because the you know this magnetic fields all over the world. Maybe the saltiness is going away. Maybe the salt monster is coming and ate all the salt. Oh, you know, it's not salty anymore. Right? Again, it's not watertight solution. It's not the kind of answer, but it gives us enough hints. It gives us enough evidences for us to see who Jesus is. That he was there before this beginning, before the world. And how he came. And how he lived. Right? And even about his birth, there's more than eight prophecies about Jesus. And just taking eight of them, right? Where he's going to be born, right? And most likely, you could say, oh yeah, just take a big guess, right? Somebody born in, you know, being born in America, or LA, or New York, or San Francisco, some big area. But Bethlehem, a tiny little city. Right? Even that, thinking those into calculation of eight prophecies about his birth. You know, the chances are, is that one out of 10 to the 17th power. You know what that is? To us, like, 1 to the 17th power. What's that? Right? 10 to the 17th power. One out of that is that you get several dollars. I don't know how many you need. But you, you, you go to Texas, which is the biggest state in continental USA, right? And you cover the Texas, the whole state of Texas, two feet deep with dollar, several, several dollars. And I drove through Texas, right? Yeah. It took 12 hours. From this side to that side, we got in there in the morning, we got out in the nighttime. And we, we, we sped, you know, right? right? Christian, man, you go over hundreds of an hour, you know? <laughs> right? we, we went fast and it still took 12 hours to go through that state, right? And you cover the state two feet deep with silver dollar and say, you can drive however you want. And you stop, right? And you pick up a coin and voila, that says Jesus. And so basically it's a beyond reasonable doubt who Jesus is because the prophecy about Jesus Christ. The prophecy about Jesus Christ. So I want to you know, give you these verses for us to really reflect and remember and think about and how it says even though, well, I didn't intentionally put the words up front for you to really think through like, hey, you know, I should memorize this kind of verse. This is from Psalm. By right, Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they come from me. Hey, do you see here? I walk through the valley of shadow. You know, the death is not a destination, but it's a gate. Even though you walk through the valley of shadow of death. So death, death is not a destination, but Solomon didn't know that, right? But we know better. Death is just the gate for you to go to different places. And he says, the valley of shadow of death. It's not death, but the shadow of death. You know, one of the old, you know, uh, theologians, he was saying, after, you know, his wife passed away, and he's coming home, and his kids were all kind of distraught and discouraged, and they're sad, and he didn't know what to uh, comfort them. And they were you know, driving, and a big moving van passes by. And the, as they were walking, uh, passing by, a shadow were, were, was, was casting upon them. And the theologian thought, oh, this is a, what a great example. He says, he told his kids, hey, do you want to be run over by a truck or run over by a shadow of a truck? And the kid says, shadow of a truck. See, you see? But this is all, in a way, trying to give us fear about shadow of death. Right? And so but God is telling us that we need to overcome it because the only way you can come, overcome it is that I will feel no evil for you are with me. His presence, His power, and His mightiness will comfort us in going through the shadow of death. Right? And since the children have flesh and blood, He too shared in His humanity so that by His death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all, all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. You know, we are afraid of dying. We are. Maybe the process of dying or the death itself. A lot of times the, the things that we do, we eat, we, we get rest, and because we are afraid of dying. And the Jesus came to defeat the death. Right? And that's why 1 Corinthians, this was a Hebrews. Uh, 1 Corinthians, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your stain? 
For sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to be God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, that nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. God has, right, He conquered death. You know, and so the reason is that when you read John, He's telling us, Right? For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, right? this is not a biology life, it's a zoe kind of life, quality of life. It's not just breathing. Just because you breathe, it doesn't mean that you are living. Right? Even so, Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jesus Christ is the judge that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes in Him, believes Him, who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from what? Death to life. He lives. He gains eternal life. Whoever believes in Jesus because He is the truth, He is the way, He is the life. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and it has come, has now come, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Right? And for the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son who have life in Himself. And He has given Him authority to judge because He is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this. For a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live. Those who have done, done evil will rise to be condemned by myself. I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. just for I seek out, not please myself, but Him who mm. sent me. You know, but I told you already, we all have committed sin. Sin of commission, Sin of omission. See, here it's true. When we hear His voice in the final days, you come out, those done good will rise to live, but those who have done evil will rise and be condemned. We are all condemned without Christ because we were the oppressors. We were oppressed, yes, but we are oppressors. We all have committed the sin of commission and sin of omission. No one is without guilt. Do you believe that? And the only one who came to took away our sin is Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, if you don't believe that Jesus died for your sins, you have your own sins. Well, what are you going to do for it? And the wage of sin is death. That's why you have to believe in Jesus. Jesus is the way, truth, and life. Jesus, the, he's the, and I emphasize the the, because he's the only one and no one else. He's the Lord of all. He is the center of everything. The center of universe, not you. Believing in Jesus, you know what that means? <clears throat> Thinking like Jesus, feeling like Jesus, and acting like Jesus. See, believing in Jesus is not just a cognitive agreement like, oh yeah, Jesus is the Lord. Believing in Jesus, it means that you are like Jesus. You're going to be like Jesus. You think like Jesus. More than yesterday, you think more like Jesus today than yesterday. You feel more like Jesus than yesterday. You act more like Jesus than yesterday. Are we growing in that? For He is the way, truth, and life. We must. We must submit. We must humble ourselves and ask God, God, change me. In my house, in our house, in our church, in our schools, in our workplaces, change me to be more like you. This world does not need more money. This world needs Jesus. And Jesus shows up in your life, through your life, because He is the light, and He shines us with His light, and we are to reflect His light in our places. May God continue to bless you with His light wherever you may go, where God shines these dark places, Dead places, decaying places, with God's presence in your life and shining the world through you guys. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you so much for our time together. We thank you that you are the author of life. That when we believe in you, that we will not perish, but we have eternal life. Grant us truth in our lives. Grant us direction. Grant us the serenity. Grant us um, this truth understanding in our lives so that we can truly follow you and truly believe in you and act more like Jesus and think more like you and feel more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we're taking uh, offering at this time. Would ushers come forward? We're so glad that you joined us this morning. And um, so please continue to fill out the connection card and you can drop it in as the offering you buy. And let me pray for us the offering. Father God, we thank you. We want to offer our times unto you, for you are our Lord of all. Thank you, Jesus for coming down 2,000 years ago and dying for our sins so that we may have righteousness in you.